everybody, we're live. Be voices off. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the November 4, 2021 planning and work session together with our monthly State Board of Education meeting. Chair Davis cannot be with us today. My name is Alan Duncan and I serve as Vice Chair of the Board and I call this meeting to order. I want to welcome all board members, advisors, staff, on-site visitors, online listeners, and Twitter followers. Remember to follow the North Carolina State Board of Education on Twitter at EdStateBoard underline NC. You can also view all meeting materials and follow the meeting online. I remind the audience and those listening that this body meets monthly. And it's official meeting typically scheduled for the first Thursday of the month. Today's meeting follows our biannual planning and work session. Momentarily, we will all have a closing keynote speech from Ms. Denise Fort, who has, for over two decades, uh, served as the federal legislative and executive branch's uh, liaison for Ed Trust in advancing education and family policy. Board members, you are reminded that it is our duty to avoid conflicts of interest and the appearance of conflicts of interest as we handle the work of the board. Does any member of the board know of any conflict of interest or any appearance of conflict with respect to any matters coming before us at this meeting? If so, please state them for the record. If during the course of the meeting you become aware of an actual or apparent conflict of interest, please bring the matter to the attention of the chair. It will then be your duty to abstain from participating in discussion on the matter and from voting on this particular matter. Board members, you have seen the agenda for over a week and had the opportunity to review it. I ask if there are any requests for changes to the agenda. If not, I request a motion for approval. So moved. Ms. Kamitz, seconded by Mr. Keenan. Ask Dr. Townsend Smith now to call the roll and to capture the vote. Yes, sir. Dr. Oxenberry? Yes. Ms. Kamitz? Yes. Mr. Keenan? Yes. Mr. Hall? Yes. Dr. Tipton Rogers? Yes. Mr. Ford? Yes. Vice Chair Duncan? Yes. Thank you, board members. At this time, will you all please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Yes. I pledge allegiance yes. to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I want to now recognize Ms. Fort, our closing keynote speaker, to end our planning and work session. At the end of Ms. Fort's remarks, we will certainly have occasion to ask any questions or make comments. And I want to also encourage any of our colleagues and our advisors who want to make any comments or reflections about the planning and work session, which has been very engaging and uh, introduced a lot of challenging thoughts, and which we have been challenged in many respects. But we want to have that opportunity for all board members who want to comment and advisors who want to add to that. So with that, Ms. Fort, welcome. We're very glad to have you with us today. Thank you so much, and I really do appreciate the invitation. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Denise Fort. I'm the interim CEO at the Education Trust, and we are a national research and advocacy nonprofit organization working to close opportunity gaps for students of color and students from low-income households. I really do enjoy having an opportunity to speak with friends in North Carolina. It was my home for seven years. First while I was attending Duke University, and later when I went on to work in Clemens outside of Winston-Salem. And through the Education Trust, I've also had the opportunity to work with a number of educators and advocates who are doing simply amazing work in their communities to ensure that underserved children have access to a high quality education. And I honestly do wish I could be there joining you in person because it's been a long time since I've had a biscuit and biscuit bill, and I love that place when I was there. 
I'm also just incredibly honored to be speaking with you because you are the people who are shaping education in North Carolina at an incredibly challenging time for students and educators. And I love the name of this gathering. It really sums it up. North Carolina, be the change, bridges to eliminating opportunity gaps, progress and promise toward a sound basic education. In particular, it really moves me because it calls out the promise and the progress that is possible right now if we can work together to do right by students. And honestly, they need us to step up right now. They've experienced more than 18 months of interrupted or unfinished learning, the lessons that students missed or didn't master during the pandemic. And to put that into a little bit of perspective, most of today's third graders have not had a normal year since kindergarten. And student performance data shows that all student learning has been impacted by the pandemic. But the impact has been far greater for certain student populations, particularly students of color, students from low-income backgrounds. And North Carolina's results, test results, revealed that 53% of eighth graders were proficient in math in 2018-19, compared to just 33% this year. The data show that schools were supporting too few students of color, students from low-income background, English learners, students with disabilities, not supporting them well enough to reach grade level proficiency in eighth grade math to begin with. And then the pandemic really exacerbated these inequities. In 2018-19, about a third of black students were proficient in eighth grade math, but this year, just 15% are. It is well documented that COVID-19 has inflicted greater pain on communities of color and communities with fewer resources. And honestly, not just the resources that our schools can offer. The recovery is slow in these communities, the direct result of many long-standing inequities, access to healthcare, jobs that allow for remote work, safe and healthy housing, among others. And we know that the pandemic's impact on students, of course, extends far beyond test scores and academics because over the past year and a half, many students required were required you know, to step up even more than before in their families and in their communities, from shouldering caretaking duties for siblings, family members, becoming more active in protest against police brutality and racial injustice on top of their studies. And many have also experienced incredible hardship, such as losing family members to the coronavirus and dealing with family members who have lost their jobs. And all of this has been especially true for students in the communities hardest hit by COVID. Students need educators like so many of you who are listening to this on Twitter or in the room to recognize and foster their assets and strengths. And too often they get the opposite. Too often students of color and students from low income backgrounds are seen as broken or in need of fixing even when it is fueled by good intentions, that mindset undermines their excellence and undermines it in real and harmful ways. And of course, students in North Carolina, and especially students from low-income communities and students of color, face a number of challenges that predate the pandemic. Uh, you all are very familiar with the Leandro Court case. Um, still winding its way through the court 28 years later, the children it was filed to help are now old enough to be parents, even grandparents, and it's still not resolved. What kind of message does this send to students and families when equal opportunity takes a back seat to politics, when they're told their history is unimportant or offensive, or when their school doesn't have a single educator who looks like them? The evidence is clear that access to a racially and culturally diverse teacher workforce is beneficial for all students, from preschool through high school graduation, for black children, white ch children, Latino children. It's especially important for these students of color who often thrive in classrooms led by teachers who, who, op who can thrive in classrooms led by teachers who share their ro racial and cultural background. Yet North Carolina, like many states, 
has made little progress in closing this diversity gap. In, in 2019, 53% of school students in North Carolina were students of color, but only 22% of teachers. Closing this diversity gap when 81% of students enrolled in educator prep programs are white will be difficult. So helping students grow academically, socially, and emotionally after the pandemic, tackling inequitable and insufficient resources, and ensuring our schools reflect, respect, and celebrate the diverse identities of our students, these are not small challenges and nor are they easy to solve. Here's the thing though, and this is what I'm hopeful about, there are areas of great opportunity where steps being taken in North Carolina over the last few years show real promise. Tremendous progress is possible if policymakers, administrators, educators can work together <laughs> and make equity-focused, evidence-based decisions now to support students in their learning. Let's talk funding first, as I know likely that's top of mind. The judge in the Leandro case has said that as early as next week, November 8th, he's considering issuing a court order to compel the General Assembly to fund a plan that includes $1.7 billion in new school funding over the next two years. And it's not just that North Carolina's judicial branch pushing on the plan that would mean more money for Lowell school districts, teacher pay raises, expanded pre-K, the state board has agreed to it, the governor's end, the legislature, long a hurdle in this fight, is currently sitting on a $6 billion budget surplus. It looks to me that North Carolina could be on the cusp of making a real progress towards fully and equitably funding a sound basic education for all children. What we need is we just need a few more adults in leadership roles recognizing that this responsibility falls squarely on their shoulders. Not only may North Carolina schools see billions more in state dollars, but they're already receiving billions of new federal education dollars. Under the American Rescue Plan, as you know, North Carolina will receive five to six billion dollars. These are vital state and federal resources that have the potential, they have promise not just to help state and leaders build back from COVID, but also to greatly improve educational equity in the state and narrow those long-standing opportunity gaps. Progress hinges on how the policymakers and administrators here today and throughout the state decide how to spend those funds. That's why my organization recently partnered with Education Resource Strategies to create a guide so that education stakeholders School board members, state and district leaders, civil rights advocates, families, advocates, and even students themselves can evaluate how well resources are being used to boost educational opportunity and create a plan for collaborative action. School funding is a critical component of education resource equity, but as this guide lays out, it is really just one of 10 dimensions critical to unlocking opportunity for every student. And these dimensions include positive school climate, engaging instruction, strong school leadership, and they're all fundamentally grounded in the daily experience of students in schools. So yes, we, we really should be asking if dollars are allocated flexibly, transparently, and in a way that allows every student to reach high standards and thrive. But we also need to be asking if every student has access to teaching practices that are engaging, culturally irrelevant, culturally relevant, and standards aligned, to arts and enrichment opportunities beyond core content. Do they experience safe schools with culturally sensitive and consistently enforced discipline policies? Progress is really possible when our schools and communities avoid a one-size-fits-all approach and instead provide students with the right combination of support based on their needs, which are different for different groups of students at different moments. This is what true education resource equity looks like, and that is how we can accelerate learning for all students so that all children can achieve their biggest dreams. So that's the picture of how these new education dollars can be used to ensure schools are better meeting the needs 
of historically underserved students. But I also know there is a lot of pressure on folks right now to focus more on short-term needs and specifically on putting evidence-based strategies into action to address the unfinished learning during the pandemic. It is a daunting task, but I'll tell you why I have hope, why I see that the promise of what these programs could do. We know what works and states now have the dollars to put it into action. The first proven strategy for unfinished learning is targeted intensive tutoring, sometimes considered high dosage tutoring, which when done well, provides students with a teacher or a well-trained tutor to work with over an extended period of time on academic skills like math or reading. And the best way to set this up is so that an individual tutor works with one or two students at a time using a skill building curriculum closely aligned with the school's curriculum and targeted to the student's academic needs. The second proven strategy is expanded learning time. Research clearly shows that increasing hours spent on core content during the school day benefits all age groups, all types of students and subject matter. It is mostly effective with class sizes 20 or fewer, and when certified teachers use a high quality standards-based curriculum that again is aligned to the school-wide curriculum. And the third proven strategy, and I really hope that people think about this and dedicate time to building an infrastructure to support this. The third proven strategy is building and maintaining strong relationships between students and school staff because we know when students have access to more strong relationships, they are more academically engaged, they have stronger social skills, and they experience more positive behavior. These three strategies show tremendous promise for students, but meaningful progress can only be achieved. These actions are taken with an equity lens, one that supports positive racial, cultural, and ethnic identity de development. To help administrators and educators do this, the Education Trust has pu published practical guidance about the most important guardrails to consider when implementing these strategies. We talk about ensuring all tutors receive pre-service and ongoing professional development because it's important that not only they can deliver academic support, but they can identify affirming practices that support the social, emotional, and academic well-being of all students. Using the schedule to expand core instruction time in ways that don't require hiring additional teachers, force students to miss enrichment programs, or return to school after hours or stigmatize participation. Hiring additional support staff who are trained to address the needs of students who have experience in increased stress and trauma. You can find these resources on our website at trust.org and I hope you'll share it. Check it out, share it with other partners in this work. And finally, I wanna talk about one final barrier to educational equity, where we see significant movement in the right direction. Because I forgot to mention, I have one more connection to North Carolina, which is I serve on the board of the Hunt Institute. Just before the pandemic struck, the Hunt Institute partnered with the North Carolina Business Committee for Education and the governor's office to hold the Drive Summit which brought together state and national experts and practitioners for a discussion of the challenges and opportunities, <clears throat> recruiting, preparing, and retaining educators of color. Since then, a plan of action has been developed and presented to the governor. Progress here is in so many places to move from, the, you know, to will come down to the political will to change the status quo to move from potential strategies that prioritize a teacher workforce that reflects the diversity of North Carolina students. It is true that the pandemic created the worst educational crisis we will likely see in our lifetime. It has created new and unforeseen challenges, but also exacerbated longstanding inequities in school systems across the country. But there is potential and promise in our response to it North Carolina can focus now on returning things back to normal. It can seize this moment to invest in building something better. And we know we can do it if policymakers, administrators, and educators can focus on what's important 
sidestep political distractions and move with urgency to adopt equity-focused, evidence-based solutions. I really do believe together we can make real progress for students of color and students from low-income households. And I'm looking forward to some Q&A. Thank you, Ms. Fort. Let me uh, turn to my colleagues and uh, look for any questions or comments that we may have. Yes, Dr. Oxendine. Thank you so much for the presentation. My name is Olivia Oxendine, and I'm from the Sand Hills um, area of the state, representing 12 school districts. And uh, I was listening very closely to your presentation, and <clears throat> mainly um, listening for strategies. And you really gave a very, pro you gave several, but two of them are very sensible, and it's the high quality tutoring to focus on training and working with a group of tutors who understand the curriculum, who understand alignment, who know how to work with small groups, especially students who are encountering pro other problems, and then uh, adjusting the master schedule to provide for extended uh, learning time. So those are they're practical and so doable. And the monies, um, I don't know, even know if we need any extra money, maybe, maybe not, to make those practical strategies, put them in place. So thank you so much for just bringing up practical thinking to your presentation. Well, thank you. And, and you are right. I mean, they are easy to put in place. I think the important thing to remember, though, is this is a long game. This is not a one and done. And to really do those things right, you do have to build the infrastructure to maintain them, which could include, and you know, working with community-based providers, but making sure that you have the infrastructure to continue the work is what's gonna be really important to accelerate that learning. I think one thing that really keeps me up at night is that um, some folks are treating things like the pandemic is over, and the, the unfinished learning really did have an impact on our kids. And, we're seeing this in so many different studies. Other questions or comments? Well, I'll just add that to your point, I would like to thank the board for its support of NC EdCorp, which will be providing high dosage tutoring all across our state. Good. Yeah. Thank you for that important and timely reminder. <laughs> um, of work that's ongoing, very important work right now. Other questions, comments? I have a Mr. Have a Hall question. and Mr. Ford. Thank you. Uh, I'm Wendell Hall. Uh, I guess my question is, as a tutoring veteran, how do you get buy-in? How do you get others to, to buy into the concept and the work that's involved? Uh, I hear about equity... I mean, all the time, I'm, I'm a product. But how do you get back in? Now, you see where I'm coming from? What strategies do, do we use? I think that is a really great question. So uh, we work uh, across the country. Actually, we're in 14 different states. And the key to impact for us is working with a broad table of stakeholders. Uh, we believe that when you can bring parents, educators, civil rights advocates, business leaders, immigration activists to the table and actually give them the research and the data, they know how to bring change for you. They know what needs to happen in order to advocate for policy changes. Um, but too often, many of those communities don't have a seat at the table. Uh, and across the country, Massachusetts, Maryland, Tennessee, Texas, Louisiana, Kentucky. It is this uh, broad stakeholder engagement that has really brought about change. Um, and there are a lot of uh, local organizations that are doing that here in North Carolina already. And it's exciting to see some of that work, but it really does take a statewide stakeholder engagement effort. Thank you. Mr. Ford. Good morning, Ms. Ford. Uh, my name is James E. Ford. Uh, I am uh, an at-large member on the state board and have the pleasure of serving as the chair of the Strategic Planning Committee along with Vice Chair uh, Jill Kamitz. And I really just wanted to make a comment to say thank you. 
thank you uh, for taking the time and in a very short amount of, uh, of, of minutes, uh, really driving home the spirit of everything that we've been uh, trying to accomplish as a board here. You have uh, spoken with eloquence about the necessity of, of centering equity and centering, centering those who are most historically marginalized and closest to the disruption to their learning, uh, but more so also giving our state some inspiration around tactics that can actually be deployed and, and frankly, a vision for how we can get there. And I think that we, we, uh, are, we stand in continual need of a jolt of inspiration uh, but also a jolt of honesty, and I think you provided dosages of both of those. So I just wanted to say thank you for your time and for sharing your talent and treasure with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Others? Any other comments or questions? Well, Ms. Ford, on behalf of the board, I want to thank you very much for your uh, words this morning, which uh, has, has already been commented, show uh, some description of the past and show a path to the future and provide hope on a, port, on a topic that everyone cares deeply about. And obviously, you've devoted much of your life's work to that, and we are thankful for that, and we're certainly thankful for, for the remarks you've brought to us today. Well, again, I really do appreciate the invitation, and uh, the Education Trust is ready to help in whatever way we can. Uh, we do bring a lot of resources to the table for um, you know, state boards, other state decision makers, and we're happy to support you all in any way and really do appreciate the opportunity to be here with you. Thank Have you. a great morning. Thank you very much. Thank you. As we close our strategic planning uh, work session, uh, let me turn it over to Mr. Ford and Ms. Kamnitz for any comments that they'd like to make and for any other board members who may want to share as we try to summarize the work that's been done the last two days, which mm -hmm. Superintendent and I were discussing this morning. It's hard work. Well, we were tired at the end of both of those days <laughs> because our, our minds were working and thinking about really significant problems and, and significant issues and meanwhile being inspired by some things that are happening. So. Uh, it's been a good two days, and so let me give, thank you for your leadership on this, and let me give you the floor. Well, uh, thank you for that, Vice Chair Duncan. I'm going to be very, very brief here before I pass it uh, over to Jill and just say that uh, it, it's, you know, people have heard me uh, in professional capacity talk about this notion of radical imagination, um, and really it, it – it's, it's an idea that situates itself in not ignoring your present circumstance, right? So you, you, you look at the reality and all of its texture and, and sometimes its harshness and its bleakness. Um, so it doesn't ignore that, but it, it, it says that despite that, I'm going to imagine uh, a possibility, uh, a future beyond that, um, that another way is possible. And I have to admit that that's, that's a difficult prospect sometimes, <laughs> that when you look at your timeline, look at the news, or you know, you can constantly bombarded with negative uh, information, that becomes difficult. But the purpose was of, of this uh, planning work session was to ground ourselves in that reality, but practice that devotion to a radical imagination. Um, that despite looking 20 years in the rear view and seeing many of the same maladies plaguing us, that another way is possible. And it's our job in this moment to cast that radical imagination into the future. Um, and I feel like that was embodied by all the presenters. Uh, some of them, I mean, I know number crunching and <laughs> you have budgets. And it's not the most exciting thing. Chair of the BizDoc community, I know you might take offense to that. Um, <laughs> but that was important work, talking about the social and emotional components of not just the students but also the adults. And the way that that's a, a central part of the learning process is hugely important. And, and then getting a chance, frankly, to speak with the folk who, who work at DPI, right, about the challenges and also the opportunities in their work. That's how we get to this place uh, of, of radical imagination and make that a reality. So I was just really, really encouraged by that. And I hope that other folks found this time uh, together to be able to fellowship with each other and learn from each other as fruitful. As we go to Ms. Camden's, I'm going to say on Ms. Shaw's behalf, I thought that was an excellent presentation. <laughs> and the key to it, of course, was it helped show us you know, what resources we have and how we try to look at prioritizing those resources, which I know you fully agree with is critical to, 
to any of this work. So it shows how it all fits together, regardless of uh, how exciting your committee may be or <laughs> how boring, in the case of BizOp, your committee may be. There are important bricks in all these committees. Yeah, and, 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 and I would love to have just a minute before we toss it to Ms. Kamitz to close. Please, Superintendent. So um, to, that, to that point about um, our, our presentation from our wonderful CFO, Alexa Schaus, um, I do want to share a couple of, of points of, I think, hopefulness in our quest for, um, for financial equity, certainly. Um, and, and that is this. I, I learned so much from, from Alexis's presentation. Um, and some of the information she shared was quite shocking, um, not the least of which was the, the fact that pension costs have doubled in the last 10 years for our teachers and the enormous amount of money that we funnel into the teacher retirement system each year to make sure that our educators will have that pension waiting for them. Um, but right now in North Carolina, I think it's important to point out a couple of things. Our highest funded groups of students in our state right now, our highest funding per pupil is for our American Indian students and our African American students. We fund the top quartile of the highest poverty schools more than the lowest. Her presentation was very clear about that. We need to be having conversations about how much more. And <clears throat> I would love to see us get a little bit more specific about how much more and where, because we we saw yesterday that we've got uh, a, a many schools that are seeing high incomes with high outcomes with less money. Now that doesn't mean that they shouldn't have more money, but we need to find out what those schools are doing and figure out what can be uh, possibly replicated or scaled. Um, right now in the United States, the four out of the six highest funded states for education rank in the bottom half for NAEP math outcomes. Why is that? What is happening that they're spending more money and getting worse outcomes? And we have that in our own state as well. And I think there's some root cause analysis that needs to be done to find out what is not working and what is working. Where are our, our failures, quite honestly, and where are our triumphs? And we have to continue to allow the data to drive us forward. <coughs> Ms. Kim. I would not presume to add to either one of those sets of comments, but I, I, actually there is one thing I want to say, though. I, I, in reflecting over the last couple of days, I would say that the theme that ran through almost every uh, uh, presentation that we heard was the importance of listening. Mm -hmm. And we certainly have been doing a lot of it the last two days, but um, it strikes me that um, I have to say to my colleagues around the table, I think that the listening starts with all of us, and um, we, have, we do a very good job of listening to each other and thinking about what we're hearing before we act, and I appreciate that very much, and I think that um, what we heard yesterday affirms the importance of that, particularly in the area of whole child and social emotional learning and the needs that we're trying to meet in our kids right now, but listening is important, and we need to continue to do that with each other. So. Thank you. Yes, Mr. King. Uh, I'd like to chime in on what the superintendent just said a few minutes ago uh, about resources and, and trying to find the answer. And of course, it's sort of difficult, but I always try to remember resources that we know money wise aren't always the answer. We got to have them make sure the right people in the right place. Because you put all the money you want to, but if that person doesn't believe in your cause, you waste your money. So uh, that sounds simplistic, but there's more to that. But sometimes you do find yourself in people who are not committed to what you're trying to do. And I always say here on the state board, we set policy, and sometimes it's very difficult for us to um, get some superintendents to necessarily buy, buy in on what we're trying to do. Because as you know, at the local level, 
that's so technical to guide the philosophy that you have as a county. And that's complex because we can do only so much for superintendents, uh, you know, for his eye involvement, but we can continue to set policy and to monitor and try to make sure the people that we, in time of education that we from this department, emphasize and do the things that show that we're committed to making a difference in equity for all, for all kids. So, um, it just ended, I'm just, I think somebody made a presentation a few weeks ago, and he stood up and said, uh, money without vision is, is a waste of money, which is true. So let's get the right people in the right places and stay on top of, of, of everything. Thank you, Mr. King. Dr. Dr. And piggybacking on what my colleague just said about getting the right people in the classrooms, getting the right people with students. We have got to continue, and I, we are, we're working hard at this, but we must be, we, it's nonstop work, in my opinion, working with our EPPs and making sure that we are putting in those classrooms teachers of color, but teachers of co all colors uh, who know how to teach folks who are good teachers. They understand standards. They understand how to convert them to lesson plans. They know how to lead small groups, how to do whole groups. They're smart in their content. And I want to put a double up, smart in their content. So we have so much to do. And I, 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 you know, I'm an EPP person. I see it. I know it. I'm in classrooms. I watch it. I spend time with principal interns. I have these discussions with them. You've got to do, you will please spend every, whatever it takes to make sure you've got the best in those classrooms, especially the students who are years beyond, I, I, I mean, this may sound negative, like the glass is half empty, but some of them, so it's just going to be hard for them to catch up. It is really math, reading, comprehension, writing, science, on and on and on, but we, we have to keep trying, don't we? So that is my, that is my wish. And to, um, I, I've got to say this, Reggie may... <laughs> want to kick me under the table. <laughs> but I will always remember yesterday afternoon when we concluded we were about to go in closed session and Reggie Keenan said, I've been here a long, long time, 20 years maybe, and I bet you were going to be here 20 more, Reggie. And I I don't want us to continue having these conversations. I want us something like that. I want some of these issues resolved and we celebrate during our planning sessions. Um, and I'm with him all the way. I, when I come back in 20 years to a planning session, I want it to be um, a big celebration of finally closing the achievement gap. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to echo the comments from our colleagues uh, concerning uh, teaching and learning and that whole process. And I was going to say when uh, you said you first asked me a question for us to reflect, and it's a known fact. We've known it for years and years. The quality of education a child receives is directly tied back to the quality of that educator who stands before them each and every day which echoes your point. And it is difficult. It is extremely difficult to, to educate a child who is lacking in the skills and to bring them up to standard over a period of time. It is difficult. But it takes a special person. And all of our teachers are special people. Don't get me wrong. But, but I think you know the training process in dealing with a certain uh, areas, uh, certain children, is what needs to be done. How is it that one teacher can reach a child in the same building, but a teacher next door can't? How is that possible? When I was in the classroom, I remember that. You know, uh, there were some kids that came in my class that used to beat the doors down next door. You know, but how is that possible? Uh, I don't have the answer. Even all these years, I've been, I, I, don't, I don't have the answer. But I know it is within us. That's why I'm asking the question about how do you get buy-in? Yeah. Those principles that you were talking about. We also know that good teachers, believe it or not, follow good principles. That's right. Repeat that. If they can. And but 
That's all it takes. But I agree. But uh, uh, Madam Superintendent, you made a statement out and, and, and it just stung me who you did. Cause I hadn't thought about that. About the fact that uh, uh, the amount of money we're spending on our low income challenging schools is higher than other schools. I hadn't thought about that. But when you add in uh, uh, federal dollars, or when you add in state dollars, that's what you're really talking about there, I think. You know, yes. Because some schools don't get low, low wealth monies. Some schools don't get small kind of supplements. Right. Uh, uh, but that's a profound statement. I hadn't, I hadn't even thought about that. So if we know, we know that the average per pupil expenditure, Alexis said yesterday, is uh, or not, no, the base. The base is about 6200 right. per child. Carroll County, who we saw present to us this week, their, their per pupil expenditure is $15,000 per child. And, and we need to ask ourselves, if that's not enough, what is enough? What is enough? Right. I, I agree with you on, on that. But I'm going to study that a little bit more as we go from month to Me month too. now. Because I hadn't thought about it that particular way. But what was the saying? Uh, we know all we need to know. Yes. To educate every child. Yes. And what's the most? Ron Edmonds. Yeah. Uh, to, to educate every child. But the point is, do we really want to? Mm -hmm. I'm paraphrasing it there. Or what you're saying. But then kind of, we thank you for allowing me. But we thank you for those comments. And uh, we got a job, my colleagues. We, we have a job. And I don't, I don't know about you, but uh, with the energy that I have left, I'm going to put it into it. Mm -hmm. I see those kids. They want my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. you know. uh, they have their own little saying, oh, you got to bling. Oh, you, know, you got to bling. <laughs> you know, and, and I'm saying, ah, well, you know. But they need it. They need the love. They need the support. And they need the kindness of knowing that you are special. And I'm going to shut up. I get on this kid. We're talking about my kids. I just Thank you. I thought I heard some amens from some of our advisors. You want to give them a chance to say anything if you would like to chime in on any, any questions? Yes, please. That's fine. So good morning. Um, you know, there's a lot of things kind of in my head. I really just appreciate the last couple of days and all the things that we've learned. And even though we see challenges, you know, and I'm still hopeful uh, that we can do this work. You know, one of the things that, you know, I challenge us and want us to think about is that, you know, we've had really great conversations and we've learned a lot and we're not in our heads, but not to allow these conversations to be in isolation. That when we make decisions, when we create plans, when we talk to groups, when we support superintendents and practitioners, that we are thinking about the things that we've learned and that we know and that we are following up with what we're saying that we believe. Um, you know, I, um, our, when I look at our, our theme for this work session, NCB the change, and thinking about my school and, you know, our, our, our theme this year is about being bold and being world changers, um, but it takes more than just knowledge, it takes action, and we have to be able to do that and keep that at the core of everything that we do. So I just challenge us, even beyond you know, this work session that when we're making decisions and creating plans that we keep this at the core of what we do so that we can actually see that change. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have any comments or reflections or thoughts or things that stuck out in your mind? Yes, Ms. Ashford. Well, this is good morning. I just wanted to say thank you to Ms. Kamitz and Mr. Ford and to Dr. Townsend Smith um, because I know what it takes to put on two days of work, right? <laughs> And y'all did it, and it also takes courage to um, to do the right thing and to have presentations that are about the right things. Um, I agree with Mr. Hall. We know what is required of the work. The question is, are we brave enough to do it? That's the real question. To actually roll up our sleeves and do what we're supposed to do to ensure that every child receives an excellent education. So thank you for the opportunity to be there. Ms. Tipton Rogers? Ms. Stevens. Ms. Stevens. Oh, very good. Ms. Stevens. <laughs> yes, good morning. Um, I, I, I wanted, it's been said um, uh, other times and this morning as well that uh, we should recruit uh, teachers of color, but what I wanted to say is having brown skin does not make you a better teacher. 
So I believe we have to be strategic in our hiring so that we can get good teachers of color uh, in front of our students. And we need to work to retain those good teachers. Thanks a lot. And I've enjoyed this morning. I absolutely uh, loved listening to uh, Ms. Fort. Thank you. Thank you. All right, anyone else? And so I want to, uh, as we close, I want to give special thanks to our advisors who are also presenters, Dr. Oxendine, who uh, made a very fine presentation that brought us to our starting point, which was the Dr. Bridges report and the commission on which she served so many years ago, which no better illustration than just how devoted she's been to the education of our students over such a long period of time. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Dr. Townsend Smith for her excellent leadership in this and for Superintendent Truitt and her staff and their excellent leadership and presentations throughout this. So it was a truly a team effort and I want to thank everybody for the work that was going into it and obviously how well it was all done. So thanks to each of you. And if I've forgotten to thank somebody, uh, shame on me, but it's <laughs> your, the thanks is extended nonetheless. So thank you to all of our presenters and thank you for all the good work that was done. So with that background, Superintendent Truitt, can't rest on your laurels. I now, <laughs> I now recognize you for your, for your superintendent's report. Thank you, Vice Chair Duncan. So I am incredibly excited to share with you um, the events of last month um, with something called the Green Strides Tour. And this was an incredible three-day visit um, in which the state of North Carolina hosted the United States Department of Education. And we were um, fortunate enough to have Deputy Secretary Cindy Martin and some of her team join us for three days spanning nine schools and four counties in North Carolina to recognize those schools, districts, and even a university who received the Green Strides Ribbon Award. So um, the Green Strides Ribbon Award, in case you don't know, is kind of like the, the Blue Ribbon. So we all know what Blue Ribbon schools are. Let's go to the next one. And um, the Green Ribbon Schools is a special award from the United States Department of Education that has three pillars that it is looking for in, in its uh, applicants for this award. One is schools that reduce environmental impact and costs. Two, improve the health and wellness of school students and staff. And three, provide effective environmental and sustainability education. And boy, did we see all three of these things during our three-day tour. So we have been participating in the Green uh, Ribbon um, Program since 2012. We've had 15 schools over the last several years win these awards, three whole districts, and two post-secondary institutions. So the cohort for this year um, included these four um, uh, institutions, which we, we did visit, Wrightsville Beach Elementary School, D.C. Virgo Prep, um, which was, is also in New Hanover. Um, the Wake County School District as a whole received this award, which is quite amazing. And then UNC Wilmington was um, the post-secondary award. So there was an incredible amount of work that, go, that, that any, anytime you host a federal agency, there's a lot of work that goes into making that happen, and this was no exception. Um, I need to give a special shout out to Julie Pittman, Freebird McKinney, um, Nathan Mowney, uh, John Long, as well as um, Blair Rhodes and Mary Lee Gibson in our comms shop, who just uh, really worked hard with the Department of Education to, to make this tour happen. Um, the goals of the tour are to visit both past recipients and new recipients. It's important to look at past recipients because we want to see what they've continued to do. 
and to see you know what's been working with with everything that that, that they're doing. Um, but what's really special about these tours is that they tend to be student led. And I'll tell you, those of you who've done this before, there's nothing more special than going into a building, being greeted by students, and then led on a tour by students. And, and that's what we saw time and time again throughout the Green Strides tour. Um, so let's, let's go on to some specifics here. So a lot of the themes, and I do have pictures to share because the, the pictures really do um, tell the story, but um, we, we, we saw a lot of um, composting projects. We saw uh, a focus on nutrition. We saw a lot, and this is, of course, one of my favorite things. We saw a lot of connections, even in elementary and middle schools, to the idea of workforce and jobs. And not just, not necessarily jobs that are green, although we did see that, but we also saw just a lot of focus on um, what uh, STEM education and how the applied learning that we saw could lead to a future job. So we started off in Wake County. We went to Abbotts Creek Elementary School, um, where we were greeted by Principal Paula Trantham. Uh, we went to Athens Drive High School, um, and we were greeted by the band, as well as Principal Stephen Maris. Um, and then we went to downtown Raleigh to Explorers Middle School, where Director Deborah Brown greeted us. So I'm really excited to share these, these pictures with you. The, the top left picture is a, um, there was an outdoor story walk, which is something that I, I think my colleagues have seen before, but I, I have never seen it, um, where it was um, integration of science and arts in an outside story walk. Um, the picture to the right of that, that's me and some students with some chickens um, at Athens Drive High School, <laughs> which is quite extraordinary. And we learned about um, gender of chickens based on their earlobes. So I never really thought of chickens as having earlobes, but they do. And we were close enough to pet the chickens and... I mean, chickens are so common, but there's something special about being up close and personal with a chicken. <laughs> it, was, it was really, really fun. And what was really great is that the kids, I mean, when you just, when you, when you get to hear teenagers talk about anything that they're passionate about, it's a great day. And, um, and, and these teenagers, some of whom were interested in going on to careers in ag, some not. But they loved these chickens, and they had been with the chickens since the chickens were little. Um, the bottom left picture is an art class that had integrated um, uh, STEM and arts, and they were they were painting the wind, which was a, a really beautiful lesson that we got to see. And then the picture on the bottom right, those children ha were having a physics lesson. Uh, these were middle schoolers, and they were you can't really tell in the picture, but they were using various materials to create roller coasters. And it was just, um, they were, it's one of those things where, you know, I used to say to teachers, what, what, does, and what does student engagement sound like, look like, and smell like? And we definitely heard that student engagement when we walked in that room. Then Wednesday in Hoke and Cumberland counties, we went to Sandy Grove Middle School um, with Principal Tommy Jones, Douglas Bird High School with Principal um, Dr. Zoletta Taylor, and Walker Spivey Elementary School with Principal Rachel Robinson. So we've got great examples of pictures here as well. So we saw a lot of um, STEM work and gardening on this visit, as well as um, drone technology, which was really, I mean, we, if, if you, you all are, should be hearing a theme of drone technology, because I've, I've talked about it like every month. We're seeing 
examples of drone technology, and this had to do with solar panels as well, so using drone technology to investigate efficacy of solar panels. So um, very interesting connections there. And then you can see the ladies in their, in their garden. Um, absolutely, we're seeing more and more outdoor education across our state. Um, I, we've seen this in, in the eastern part of the state, the central part, and the western part, where there's just um, uh, not just, let's, let's take our stuff and go sit outside, but intentional, deliberate outdoor learning spaces. And go to the next one. And then Thursday, we spent the day in New Hanover County. So we started off at Wrightsville Beach Elementary with Principal Jackson Norval. Then we went to D.C. Burgo Prep, which is one of our lab schools. You all remember Senate Bill 599 and the creation of our, of our lab schools? I uh, remember when that legislation was passed, and we all thought, how in the world are we going to create these lab schools in the, in the time given? And I'll tell you what, that, that lab school was absolutely incredible, and it was amazing to, to see it having come to fruition. And then, um, of course, that lab school is attached to UNCW, so um, um, we, we did, uh, Dr. Dempsey greeted us along with Chancellor Sardarelli, and we had a, a wonderful visit at um, the Watson College of Education. So the top left picture is Wrightsville Beach Elementary School. These children have the privilege of being at a school every day that is located on the water. It was absolutely beautiful. And the community built a dock so that the children could go out um, uh, and, and have an outdoor classroom. So they were fishing, they were using nets, they're looking at um, wildlife. It was really fantastic. Um, to the right, you, this, this was at DC Burgo. There is a, um, a gentleman there who's a grad student at, um, at UNCW, Watson College of Education, and he is um, teaching there, and he's doing a lesson on growing um, uh, molds and fungi. <laughs> so, if the, if the, of course, the kids were just absolutely fascinated, but those are jars of, um, of, of mold. It was really, really incredible. This bottom left picture, oh, the bottom left picture is at UNCW. And these, this is a giant stand-up iPad. They, they can stand up or they can lay down and they are about the size of a person. <laughs> and this was an anatomy class where students were, so, so there, there, in various places of the world, there were people who gave their loved ones to science, and these bodies had been sliced and scanned to be a, a, uh, an electronic virtual cadaver. And so instead of having a cadaver lab, which they, they, they were building, but they, they have these giant iPads. And so you can literally look at the whole body. You can, um, you can take away all of the systems except the circulatory system, or you can take away all of the systems except the muscular system. Um, it was absolutely fascinating. And seeing the students, um, we were in their life sciences building, and seeing the students engaged in the way that they were was, was just really special. And then finally, you see Dr. Taylor there on the right um, in what was called a, um, an action behavior room. And this was unlike anything we had ever seen. This is a room where elementary age children can go when they need to take time. So this, this is an example of reducing exclusionary discipline practices. So this is something that would allow de-escalation to occur before something might raise to the level of a disciplinary practice that would exclude someone from school. Um, this is a, a obviously monitored by adults, 
but it is a place where students can come um, to talk through their feelings while they are moving. But it's also a place where students who might need to move while they learn could um, could do so. So if they wanted to do their math while they're swinging their legs, they they can do that. Um, they can. This 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 was like a little obstacle course that you see Dr. Taylor on. <laughs> um, and then there are um, all kinds of information around the room about connections between movement and, and bra the brain and learning. So we wanted to just spend a second to talk about how this aligns to Operation Polaris. Um, so you, you will have noticed in those pictures that um, Dr. Harvey and Dr. Taylor accompanied us on those full three days. Um, of course, student support services is one of the pillars of Operation Polaris. And the Green Stripes Tour really allowed us to um, have a laser focus on student nutrition needs, social emotional learning needs, um, school facilities, um, how, how those three things are being done on a day-to-day -day basis in a way that prioritizes the student needs. You know, because, you know, sometimes we do things in a way that prioritizes adults instead of students. But these three schools had it right. They, these, th these things were done with students at the center. And, of course, this is leading to broader conversations for, for all of us about how we support students both while they're at school and not at school. We continue to see districts committed to not just feeding students at school, but feeding communities. Um, how are we uplifting academic and non-academic needs? Uh, there was a time when I'm sure the, that the, the idea of an action behavior room would, would not have been well received, but um, hopefully those days are past. Um, and how are we innovating and building classrooms to be good stewards of the environment? as well as to bring in ideas about how these things all combine to lead to careers. And again, we, we just, we all learned so much. We had such great conversations with one another. Um, there's a lot of people in this room who were part of that tour. Um, and again, thank you to everyone who um, was involved in organizing that tour. Um, and I think, I think there's one more slide, I just remembered, our now what slide. Um, so we are going to continue our promising practices and best practices work um, and uh, continue to find ways to share these with, um, especially as we continue to have conversations about health and wellness and those non-academic needs across our state. Um, we want to identify sustainable practices that could be replicated. Um, again, we love seeing these, these outdoor classrooms and, and gardens, and the kids of all ages absolutely love that. Um, we are continuing to see more certificate and license programs, licensure programs in our middle and high schools. And we want more schools and districts to apply to be a Green Ribbon School. Um, you know, I, my, my team sometimes gets frustrated with me because my, sometimes my first instinct is to say, do they really want us to come and visit? It's so much work. Why, we're going to interrupt everything. You know, is it, is it really worth all the time and effort? And of course, the answer is always yes because the schools love to get visits from the public. They, and not just me, they love to get visits from everybody. And teachers love to be lifted up during these visits. They love to show off everything that they're doing as individuals every day to meet the needs of their students. And I just continue to share with you the amazing things 
that my team and I see when we go into districts. The love, the support, the, um, the heart and soul of these teachers over the past 20 months that continues to, to beat and continues to love on their students. And I, I just, I, I leave every time saying, we're not worthy, we're not worthy. And um, I, it, it, it's my hope that if uh, our members of the board, if you've not been in a, in a school lately, that, that you will take that opportunity because it is um, a thing of beauty to see our, our students' needs being met on a day-to-day -day basis in the way that we all have had the privilege to see. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Superintendent Truitt. Are there any questions or comments for Superintendent Truitt? Do we have a, um, maybe a list of where these schools are around the state? I mean, are they pretty much dotted around the regions? The I mean, schools that are taking part or? In the green strides, mm -hmm. it, yes. Mm -hmm. Would be good to know. So, so the, this visit included um, uh, both past winners and current winners, but the current winners were the, mm -hmm. the um, Wake County as a district, mm -hmm. right. um, Hoke and Cumberland, and um, uh, New Hanover County. But are there others that are getting in the process of this? Yeah. Yes. I mean, there's they they do the awards. Is it? I'm trying to remember if it's every year or every other year, but yeah. It's good to know. Yeah. There's a lot. Yeah. All right. Not seeing any others. Thank you very much, Superintendent Truitt. We will now proceed to our committee reports. I remind committee chairs in the audience that all voting on consent and any item requiring action will be done at the end of the agenda via roll call. We will begin with Mr. Wendell Hall for Government and Community Affairs Committee report. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and good morning to all once again. Uh, my name is Jay Wendell Hall. Uh, I chair uh, the uh, Legislative Community Affairs uh, Committee uh, with the uh, Vice Chair of Ms. Jill Kamis. I don't know why we call it something different. But anyway, do, do apologize for it. Last name. Uh, we are proud to present some additional information to the board, uh, update uh, the board's uh, 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 direction of going up and trying to find and identify uh, those districts that's involved in the community side of developing uh, programs to help the whole child deal with the whole child initiative. Uh, yesterday, of course, we heard this week. We've heard a lot about that and the equity side. Uh, yesterday evening, of course, we heard from Rockingham County, uh, their efforts in, in the mental health issue. And we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, things that have affected children over the last uh, 16 months that maybe we've forgotten about. Thing. But right now, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Uh, Freebird McKinney if he would come forth and uh, start us with our uh, uh, report. Uh, we do have Ms. Julie Pittman, uh, Dr. Stagall, and Ms. Christy Van Honken, I think that's her last name, mm -hmm. uh, whom I met uh, this week. Uh, was sitting at the table. I knew the, the lady that she came up to me and introduced herself to me, uh, who will also report this morning for us. Uh, Mr. McKinney. Good morning, Superintendent Truitt, Vice Chair Duncan, Lieutenant Governor Robinson, Treasurer Falwell, board members, advisors, colleagues here at DPI and the board, and our friends across this great state of the Shire. My colleagues, Ms. Pittman, Dr. Stegall, and Ms. Von Aachen are grateful for the leadership of this committee's chairs and the opportunity to share with you today. So we, uh, we wanted to start uh, echoing um, uh, the, the committee's vice chair Kamnitz's words, listening starts with all of us. And I think sometimes it's as simple as seeing and being seen. Um, and uh, we were invited to attend a series of football games across the state during the month of October. 
Uh, and, and this one really stuck out to us. And um, uh, there's a story here. Uh, and this was the Friday Night Lights event uh, of Tuscola versus Pisgah High School. Um, and it reminded me of, of one of my best friends, Patrick Henry's uh, song called Living in a Football Town. And there are a couple of phrases that always kind of jump out to me because I didn't grow up in a situation where we had, you know, an event like this game right here. 12,000 people. The 50-50 winner won $9,000. Uh, you know, and so just, just to kind of put those things and encapsulate some of the moments. Uh, you know, uh, it, it, a couple of lines from that song are, you know, 100, 100 yards of sacred ground, living in a football town. Um, you know, life is simpler than everything working towards first and ten. Behind the field, there's a railroad track. All stars leave, salesmen come back. People come from miles around living in a football town. You know, and, and I hope that these pictures do justice to what our team got to experience. This is literally sitting on the top of the middle school with Principal Graham Hayes uh, and Assistant Superintendent Jill Barker looking down on this event. Tuscola's side over on the left, Pisgah's side over on the right, uh, and, and just a packed night. And, and again, there's a story here, and it, it's a story of resilience, and we've shared about Haywood County before. Uh, dealing with the flood and overcoming, you know, their their typical friend, the Pigeon River, who who uh, who, who got a little bit uh, uh, violent at times and, and destroyed the Pisgah Stadium. So they moved this game, uh, and this game is called the the Hill versus the Mill. Uh, and if you look there, you, it's, it reminds me a lot of Keenan Stadium, uh, where the trees are still taller than the stadium up on the hill. But if you look here, this is the Mill. So this is Pisgah, and. and uh, uh, the, you can see the mill in the very background, the Pigeon River is right there on the right. Uh, and, and this really brings the community together. And you can see here on the, on the, on the left side, you know, Tuscola versus Pisgah. Uh, they were friends uh, when we were having uh, and sharing dinner together. But, but when the ball kicked off, uh, it was a little different. Uh, you can see Senator Corbin there in the middle joined us to take part in this night. Uh, and this is a story of resiliency, is a story of community. Is a story of pride. It was a story of honoring service and first responders. It was a story of support for the growth of their students, both academically, and we could talk about their academic growth and, and success in this district, but also just the, the, the physical and the personal growth of these students. It, it's also a story of returning to normalcy. This was a packed stadium. It was the first time really personally I I, I didn't think about the pandemic, and I know our team kind of, you know, really talked about that. Uh, but lastly, it, it's just the power of what our schools mean to our communities and to the individuals that were there, to those all-stars that went back and returned to salesmen to watch their sons and daughters in the band and, and the cheer and the dance team and, and, then, and then on the football field. So just wanted to, to, get, to say thank you for Hayward County's uh, gracious hosting of our team on, on this night and and wanted to celebrate the Hill versus the Mill. So now uh, working on the, the current trends that, uh, that, that Chair Hall and Vice Chair Kamnitz has tasked this team with, and we're going to provide multiple examples today of uh, continuing what the planning and work session set up. I think this was one of the most beautiful parts uh, of the last several days as we saw this partnership and the power uh, of support between the districts and, and DPI. And we're going to start today with uh, Whole Child and, um, and uh, the, uh, Healthy, um, excuse me, Whole Child, Whole School, and Whole Community Initiatives and Programs. And did want to bring up, this was something that we're really working hard on, and I'm, I'm very excited. We've got a meeting coming up uh, that, that um, Vice Chair Cabinet's tasked our team with and really building out like those next steps, data and evaluation and analysis of these initiatives and programs that we share. Uh, we'll be working with Dr. Marr, Dr. Mullinex, um, uh, Dr. Korn, and uh, Lynn Barber, and, and, and that team uh, specifically as to like echo on that what ne what's next. Like, okay, now that we're seeing this, we're scouting, we're seeing these examples and these bright lights across the uh, state, how do we then build on the capacity of those? How does Dr. Mullinex help us to build what we see into that promising practice? And then being able to share that out. Uh, so we'll, we'll, get, we'll provide some examples of that today. And then just looking at the, the data dashboard, I wanted to highlight particularly Rockingham County um, and looking at their, uh, their discipline. 
And seeing that line going down, I think, was is a direct reflection of their commitment and their dedication to what we witnessed yesterday. And, and that came out of a visit that we had um, uh, uh, very recently. So, uh, if um, and I'm going to briefly go through these because they did such a phenomenal job yesterday of tying this all together. Um, but what we witnessed in Rockingham County was a commitment and a dedication to student health and well-being uh, that was also um, – brought about by Project Aware and Activate, and we've, we've talked about this several times, so there's just, again, an informational slide that, that shares that. Um, but as you heard yesterday, uh, Superintendent Rodney Shotwell and Dr. Stephanie Ellis, who is their Executive Director of Behavioral Health and Crisis Intervention and Student Safety, and then our colleagues here at, at the department, Dr. Heidi Austin, who is the Project Aware Director, and Beth Rice, who is our Social Emotional Learning Lead. Uh, and uh, on the IAPS team, as well as the uh, the leader of the SEL implementation team. And this was one of those great moments where, where the whole entire team was able to see what Rockingham's dedication looks like. Um, and they were able to then kind of bring that back to our planning and work session yesterday. Um, and, and I was struck by something that the chair said yesterday about the integration of the director's work during the panel. And, and this is another brilliant example. We, we saw... Uh, Dr. Cynthia Martin and Dr. Bev Emery and Dr. Um, Catherine Edmonds share out about what their team has been doing to support Tyrell County and Robeson County, or Robeson, excuse me, um, and, and, and that powerful partnership. And I think this is another one of those examples that, that we can really look to. Um, the next couple of slides are just some of the pictures. We are joined by Representative Hurdle, uh, who uh, also is former law enforcement uh, also former school board, so really had some unique perspectives on the legislative side. And as you listened to the presentation yesterday, um, that unique partnership uh, with the law enforcement, you know, uh, as um, Dr. Ellis was sharing, that li literally if something had happened in the community or in the neighborhood uh, of a particular student, they would just make a simple message to the principal in the school, and then that child would be handled with care. And I think that's a really unique opportunity for us to look at the strength and the power of the partnerships and in a very positive way how we're working with the law enforcement and, and school safety. Uh, the next couple of slides are, are reiterating that there is data collection to support this. Um, and that's another thing that we want to build on as our team works with the Office of Learning Recovery and Acceleration is how can we make that data more accessible and then how can we use that in our advocacy efforts to not only duplicate this across the state, but to garner uh, additional resources where they're needed for districts who would like to do something as comprehensive as the infrastructure and the continuum of Rockingham County Schools. Uh, a couple of the highlights of, of this particular visit, we were able to see their day treatment program led by Serena Hooker. Uh, this was a very unique opportunity, and, and again, Dr. Ellis referenced this yesterday, where if there are students who really need that additional care, if, if it's a, a long-term suspension, rather than they go home and, and sit uh, and, uh, and not feel that, you know, the ability to kind of build on that student mental health and, and that uh, personal responsibility, mm -hmm. they go to this day treatment center. We walked around. There are behavioral health uh, specialists there really engage teachers, and they build this environment for students uh, to, to not only another level of self-actualization, but in a tiered way, get them re-entering uh, into their schools. Um, and and it, was, it was such a profound experience to see that all of these teams working together, this it represents their infrastructure and their continuum. Uh, so again, um, Dr. Shotwell shared out their uh, county's commitment and his um, discussions with their uh, county commissioners or school board for those additional behavioral health specialists. But then also these teams that they put together that are very specific to individualized uh, programs. And then we had a, a chance to visit Huntsville Elementary School uh, with our team to see set how they implement and integrate SEL uh, lessons into their everyday classroom learning. We then wanted to see a district where they did not have the Project Aware uh, Activate grants, but was also showing a commitment to this at multiple levels. And so uh, we went uh, all the way out to the east, to uh, Edenton Chowan, uh, and looked at their student mental health support um, and had a, re a really unique opportunity to walk through the beginning of their school day. So uh, in the videos that you saw with Rockingham County, very similar situations where they integrate 
Um, there's morning meetings, and uh, Principal Michelle Newsom actually has uh, what she calls cubby time um, every morning where she uses uh, SEL uh, skills and builds them into morning announcements. She has cubby paws, uh, which were their like kind of shout outs to specific students who, um, who really just need to be lifted up for their efforts. Their mindful moments. We saw the calm corners in the classroom. Um, there were also a calm room, which is where in the bottom left hand corner we're standing in there. And, and what it did is it just really showed a, um, a district's commitment to these efforts. Uh, and then we ended the morning with speaking with uh, Regional Teacher of the Year, Jen Atkinson, about how she, as a teacher, not only uh, integrates this into her classroom, but also, as, as Mr. Ford mentioned earlier, how this is a way for the staff also to, to feel that social emotional uh, learning and that student mental health, but then at the staff level as well. Uh, so it was really great to hear her perspective there. I'm now going to turn it over to my colleague, Ms. Pittman. Good morning. So a second focus that the committee has charged us with is coordinating and consolidating partnerships with PSUs and statewide organizations whose primary focus is on developing and implementing teacher recruitment and retention strategies um, in, in a lot of cases, particularly with um, educators of color. So as you know, there are several organizations across the state who are focusing on this work. Um, many of whom have had recent reports, events, and convenings. And we've um, briefly touched on trends in the Latinx uh, educational uh, realm in, a, in the October board meeting. And some topics bubbled up after that um, that really uh, focused on desiring more data around this. So luckily, the Latinx uh, Ed had a summit a couple of weeks after that. Um, actually, I believe the next week, and uh, we were able to hear from Rebecca Tippett from Carolina Demography, uh, who reported on exactly this type of data that we needed. Um, so here you'll see just a summary of some of that data, that North Carolina has 1.1 million Hispanic um, population, which is 15 times larger than it was in 1990. That one in nine North Carolinians are Hispanic, but one in six North Carolina children ages zero to 17 are Hispanic. So if you look at the next slide, you'll be able to see how that growth has really catapulted in a more visual way. Um, so if we're thinking about one in six of our students um, that are Hispanic, you'll, you'll note that that's, that's a pretty significant growth and something that we would need to be able to, um, to attend to in the work that we're doing. So on the next slide, um, you'll be able to see, um, uh, we've linked in here a little bit of information about the Latinx Ed Summit, um, and you can, um, if you want to dig into some more of that information, there's a link at the top of that. Uh, in your notes where you can um, listen to all the recordings and really see some of the work, hear some of the voices from the field, specifically from teachers um, who are in the classroom, uh, who are able to give their own perspective about uh, what it's like being a Latinx teacher, what it's like teaching Latinx students, what it's like teaching all students. Um, so on the next slide, um, you'll be able to see, um, we, we briefly touched on this in the past as well, um, that Latinx Ed is launching SMSNC, which is a listening tour that will engage parents, communities, educators, and students as we work together to identify the needs and promising practices across the states. They're launching a, a listening tour in all of the um, eight regions of the state. Uh, these, um, in these meetings, uh, we'll be able to see how uh, particular communities are actually working to build better health and well-being of all their students and their staff and schools across North Carolina. Um, next slide, please. I think this is, um, Dr. Stegall is going to come up and talk about a little bit more of this work that we saw in Burke County. Thank you very much. Uh, as was mentioned, one in six students being uh, Hispanic, Latinx, creates a new set of opportunities for us as educators. One of the privileges we have as board members and department staff is we have tremendous ability as a collective group. But what we've seen over the last year and a half with the pandemic is the ability that the districts need from us right now is availability. And being out and seeing them and hearing them and talking to them and knowing their needs is a key piece of that. 
Burke County is an example of what happens when we're available and connect with LEAs. Every LEA in the community has a story to tell. Even more so, every community in LEA have, LEA have a success story to tell. And Burke's success story is one of parent engagement, immigrant support, champions of their plight that help non-English speaking families navigate and migrate through the barriers of learning how to integrate to a new community, new country, new school district, and thrive. Burke has a high concentration of immigrant families from Guatemala. Uh, the gentleman you see in the bottom right is Mr. Pedro. You've heard his name mentioned before here. Mr. Pedro was a parent who saw a need in, with his own children, but other children uh, in the school his children, his, uh, his children went to. Uh, he wanted to be part of the solution because he saw that there were a number of students coming from Guatemala and other places who had uh, trouble communicating, understanding the needs of the how you move through school, parents wanting to know how they support their child, and he stepped in the gap to help families as they, uh, as he too was a first generation citizen from Guatemala. He gained their trust and became the welcome wagon for, uh, lack of a better term, for Burke County Schools. And, and the school district saw the value he was adding and actually saw uh, enough to hire him as a staff member to be part of that connection to the parents and that community engagement. Student success skyrocketed. Parent engagement uh, improved drastically. Community and school partnerships multiplied, all because one person was available and filled a need. Over time, two other parent engagement educators were added, and uh, if you top left corner, you'll see those other two with him. Uh, the young lady on the left was actually, uh, her family were uh, missionaries in Guatemala, and so she had was born in America, raised in America, but spent a great deal of her uh, youth in Guatemala, and so she understood the culture, the needs, the support, the language, uh, and has served as a great resource. And then the young lady on the right was actually a student, uh, I believe, from, uh, she a first generation from Guatemala herself, and grew up in the district and has been a great resource as well. Now Burke's entire LEA has become a beacon of promise on parent and community engagement. Quantitative and qualitative measures all reflect the impact that just a few people who stepped up when a need presented itself can make. Uh, now through an article that was written about this visit we had and published, other LEAs are reaching out to Freebird and other team members asking if we could share the story, connect the districts, uh, collaborate to support their similar needs and learn from Burke County, who's doing this well. These promising practices share uh, should not only be regionalized and hidden, but many communities have similar needs that can learn from it. Our visits are highlighting success stories. These stories are being shared, tweaked, replicated, and magnified across the state. And these waves of connectivity are what we must continue to lift up and magnify as we navigate so much uncertainty and challenge. Wanted to briefly highlight a couple of more initiatives that we're working on, uh, and currently there's several of us on uh, Superintendent Truett's team that are attending the Elevate NC Higher Education led by Hunt Institute, and, and that focus is really on um, students and their access and needs. I think one of the most important takeaways from our first meeting was the importance of the pipeline development in human capital as it comes to uh, K-12. Uh, many of the individuals that, uh, and education leaders that were in that room and on this team um, are, are higher level, but I think we are all discussing, particularly with our community college partners, how to build that two plus two pipeline. So I'm um, very excited. The next meeting for this will be in January. So um, uh, Mr. Wallace and I will make sure uh, that we report on, on that following up. Um, also, we'll be uh, attending, listening to the North Carolina 10 on November 10th. Um, and this is an effort uh, by the John M. Belk Endowment Hunt Institute, Creed, Ed NC, and My Future NC, and, and listening to improve post-secondary experiences and outcomes from our North Carolina's 10 historically black colleges and universities. Uh, so we're very excited about this. They have actually had previous meetings, but uh, our, our team has been invited to this one, so we will report back. And also wanted to share out um, the color of education also took place recently, and this uh, presentation was developed prior to that being concluded. So we'll report back in December uh, on that. Several uh, 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 and in this boardroom alone, we're, uh, we're on that. So we will be reporting on that. And then lastly, North Carolina Stride Teacher Recruitment Action Plan was released. Uh, and so we wanted to highlight some of their recommendations. Um, December 7th will be uh, a... Um, the, the next meeting where this group, uh, led by Best NC, will meet. Now I want to bring up uh, our colleague, uh, Ms. Van Ocken. 
Good morning, everybody. Very excited to report to you today on a wonderful um, project in Brunswick County called Project Search. So this is a very cool workforce initiative that is um, focused on ECR exceptional children. And often, when we think about employability, when we think about workforce, we have to remember that it's every child, right? It's all children that matter. And so we wanted to highlight this particular promising practice, which is going to be led by Dr. Angie Monix in the back, as one of our first highlights in, in, the, in the area of workforce development and internships. So Project Search in Brunswick County focuses on the EC population, and it's business-led. So that to us was, is critical as we think about workforce cultivation, making sure that there's a business partner that's involved in the project as well. It's a one-year school-to-work program that gives these, these students a very meaningful in-work um, experience. So um, again, going back to the partners, it wasn't just the school district, it was also Brunswick County, um, it was also the community college and Novant Health. And every one of those partners had to buy in in a very meaningful way, both in terms of resources of people and in resources in terms of money and contr contributing to the success of the program. So um, the, the Department of, uh, of Health and Human Services and their Vogue Rehab, also an important partner in this. So when we think about this, we think about that commitment, right, and that, that partnership that really comes in and something that Mr. Hall, Ms. White, and I talked about yesterday is when we think about you know, how do we lift up our children and make sure that they are ready for the post-secondary plan of their choice, that, um, we are, that, that we are bringing in the right partners to make that happen. So what are some of the outcomes? Let's really focus on what are the deliverables, because it's not just a feel-good story, right? This is really about making sure that these, that these students, like every student, um, is ready for a career when they leave. Um, high school. So every student, every student, all students are on a career journey, and we have to remember that, right? From kindergarten on, every student is on a career journey. So how do we start to really focus that in our educational journey? Um, this, this required com complete community buy-in. So everyone in the community really got behind this, including the teachers, and that was actually one of the coolest moments, was thinking or, or watching the, the teacher and the students interact together when asked, because, you know, EC students may, may not feel, you know, we come in, all of these adults into a room with, with children that maybe feel a little overwhelmed. And that teacher had this beautiful way of coaxing, you know, conversation and getting them to tell us their story. And it was just the coolest, coolest thing. Um, and what we also had the opportunity to see were grateful parents, parents that really cared about their students also having a, a, a successful work pathway. So... Um, in, in kind of just in conclusion, as we look at this and all the hard work that went into it, now we see multiple departments inside the hospital that want one of these interns as part of their teams too. So um, we hope to be able to replicate this kind of program, to lift it up as part of promising practices, and you'll see more about this in the coming months. Thank you. Finally, or next to finally, I just want to reiterate what we talked about at the end of the day yesterday, and that is our upcoming AIM conference, um, which you'll be getting some information about from Dr. Townsend Smith um, uh, later this week. Uh, the AIM conference is November 29th, 30th, and December 1st. We have um, teams of uh, folks from schools from all across the state, including representation from all of our lab schools, many of our charter schools. Um, we're going to have about a thousand people who are going to be there, and that will include people from within DPI, um, as well as some of our community partners will be um, presenting. So if you turn to the next page, um, you'll be able to see a brief overview of the schedule. Um, it does start on Monday morning um, and goes through Wednesday just before lunch. While Wednesday is the next state board meeting committee day, um, if you come to the breakfast that morning to be able to hear Coffee with Catherine 
and the panel that she'll be leading with our two teachers of the year and two principals of the year to serve as your advisors that morning. Um, we'll make sure that you get back in time uh, to start your board meeting right on time um, and maybe even grab a coffee before you walk in the boardroom. Um, you'll also see lots of other incredible things that are on that page, um, including um, some things that we're going to be talking about, the system of education, um, and uh, hearing student voices on Tuesday, uh, which I'm really excited about to have several student voices um, that are going to be live there to present how their public school educational experience has impacted their lives. Um, we've also partnered with in CSPRA, who's putting together a video for us to hear many other student voices from across the state on that exact topic. Um, we are going to have some fun networking events, like a food truck rodeo on Monday night and an AIM Fest, where you'll be able to participate in lots of incredible um, activities that are school club-like. Um, for instance, um, I think Dr. Angie Mullinex is leading some PBL work with us. We've got um, uh, Dr. Ashburn's, uh, one of her uh, teachers, Betsy Graves, who's a dance teacher, um, and some of her students are going to be coming in leading some fun dance. Um, my brother, who actually teaches at Panther Creek High School, is a theater arts teacher, and his wife, who teaches in Chapel Hill Carborough, are doing arts and theater. Um, and then lots of other things that our DTL team, led by the great and awesome Jill Darrow, um, it will uh, be leading us through some incredible things that um, our students experience on a day-to-day -day basis. But more importantly, on on the next slide, you'll see um, a draft list of all of the breakout sessions and how they align to the six strands of the conference. Um, and how our teachers and other educators who will be there will be able to experience a wide wealth of opportunities for digging into uh, things that they believe they need uh, more assistance with in order to bulk up on how they are doing the work of education in their own schools and districts. Um, you'll see that all of these things align with Operation Polaris, um, tag words like literacy, student support services, accountability, learning recovery and acceleration, human capital, and school and district transformation. But also, as we've talked about over the last couple of days, is how, and even uh, last month's board meeting, is how Operation Polaris aligns with, and we are working to find an implementation plan um, that we can all work together with the state board's strategic plan and action framework. Um, and that work is going to be led by our regional directors, our charter school directors, and um, also the great Laura Bilbo Berry, who's going to be able to help us. Um, with some of our other uh, schools that are going to be in attendance um, and how we're able to really pull all of those things together so that our schools can align their strategic plans with that of the state. So we're really hopeful that you'll be able to come and participate with lots of our, um, of our school agencies there. Finally, um, in our, I'm going to recap a little bit on DC Virgo that we heard from with um, with uh, Superintendent Truitt, um, and and this is our Spotlight School that Chair Davis uh, tasked us with, really looking at spotlights. So I want to dig in a little bit more um, and add on to what Superintendent Truitt talked about with DC Virgo Preparatory Academy. Um, two things that have stood out to me over the last 11 months that I've been in this role, that I've gleaned from Superintendent Truitt, um, which is also echoed in the work that I've watched and experienced over the years that this board has done, are these things. Number one, I see you and I hear you. And number two, now what? So while we got a glimpse of D.C. Virgo from Superintendent Truitt's presentation on the Green Strides um, tour, the story of D.C. Virgo um, and the lives that it has touched that it, it has touched is not just that for its students, but also for their families and their community. Um, Mr. Ford talked earlier about radical imagination, and DC Virgo um, lives this. Um, and another way that it, it re envisions other ways that kids and students can um, can really live out that radical 
imagination, that what can they do to really change their lives and how can they really utilize their resources to make that happen. So you see a picture of um, Principal Sabrina Hill Black, and she is representative of everything that this school does. She is married to that school. Um, she loves the work that her, her um, teachers do. She is engaged in her community and engages her community in that school. She knows those kids and their families and she offers them opportunity and promise for the things that they can do to change their lives. Um, if you go to the next page, you'll see um, one of the things that stood out most to me about D.C. Virgo Preparatory Academy when I first visited it over three years ago was its motto, that D.C. Virgo is where families come to school together. And I just think that's a really great mantra for a school to have, that it's not just about the kids, but we've heard it today um, with Dr. Seagull um, in the last couple of days that we can't just do school between teacher and student. We have to involve our parents, our families, our communities, and our stakeholders in order to really build the strongest possible opportunities for our students. Um, you'll see that DC Virgo is um, led by a strong leader, but all of the people who are involved in DC Virgo are leaders from the the um, the minister down the road who comes and opens the door for kids every morning, every single morning, and when he's not there, they ask where he is. To the parents who come and engage in the kids' work every single day, from UNCW and their graduate students and professors who not only um, painted steps and re, um, redecorated rooms in the building, but who are also teaching classes alongside their teachers. To um, And everywhere in between, we saw kids as young as kindergarten leading our tours throughout that school and showing us what they were learning. You can see um, that they not only have that action-based um, learning room, but they also have another space led by their school social worker um, who really helps kids and teachers come into a space and make sure that they are communicating well together, that they are balancing their lives well, and they are ready to go back into the classroom in order to learn and excel every day. Um, I think you can see just a recap of some other pictures that we saw. Um, one of the one one of the pictures that I love, and I've seen this in um, in schools before, is their multiplication table um, stair step, where kids can learn their multiplication tables as they are walking from one part of the campus to the next. Um, every inch of that school campus is used for learning and every breath that every single person takes on that school campus is living a life of future and promise and hope for their students. Um, from Sabrina Hill Black, the principal, New Hanover County Schools, UNCW, that community and its parents, they see their kids and they imagine radically to ensure Success, hope, dreams, vision, content, health, safety, love, and the future of each and every kid who crosses the threshold there. We saw this and we see it not just in D.C. Virgo, but in the stories that we hear from schools all across the state. So how can we learn from what our schools are doing and how can we use it to now help all of our students in North Carolina to align the strategic, so that we can align the strategic plan, Operation Polaris, um, and ultimately all the work that we're doing from our directors and um, and and all of their, their the people in their organizations to our teachers and our parents and our families and our communities to make North Carolina the best place to live and learn and grow and thrive for each and every student. Thank you. Do you all have any questions or comments? Yes, ma'am, Dr. Oxenbauer. Thank you very much. Very informative. Um, I'm really pay, paying a lot of attention to all of it, but zeroed in on the lab school piece. Um, just a question for my own knowledge. Um, do we track the achievement of lab schools? Are they part of our EVOS system? 
the students take the EOCs, EOGs rather? Okay, so how do we, is all of that, um, are the data filtered through, does it flow through the Board of Governors? I will follow up on that and see how the data is. I, I would just like to know a little bit more about how those kids are doing in those labs. It's a very innovative concept. Yeah. Looking at lab schools as a laboratory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So well, and, and one of the, I know that uh, currently there's deliberation right now to add uh, additional lab schools to, uh, to, you know, so that I think. That goes to the core of what Superintendent Truett talked about: is honing in on the data, and is if, if it's it is uh, working and we and they're excelling, learn. then we need to duplicate that. So them. I'll follow up on that. Our team will look, take a look Thank at that and get much. back to you. Thank you. Any other questions? Hi. Hello, everyone. Um, Hey, Freebird, how are you? <laughs> I am. I was just really excited to hear all of the great things happening across our state. One of the things that I was holding on, I've been holding on to, was what Superintendent Truett said in the beginning of her presentation about how our districts really enjoy our visits and how sometimes you do feel like you're inconveniencing them to buy, even come in by sometimes because you know you don't want to interrupt the learning and the great things that are taking place. But this is truly another example of just being able to highlight those wonderful things. And they love to show off the wonderful things that they are doing. I'm on district number 38 this coming up week. And I can honestly say it has been very empowering and uplifting to see the students and my colleagues really digging into the work and doing the things that are best for children. I really loved how you all were talking about those family engagement specialists and the power that they are playing in the communities that are growing so rapidly in our state. Um, and the other part of that, about that is I, I can speak to that as well. In my time in Yatkin County Schools, I saw the power of having a Latino teacher of color in the classroom, actually speaking in English and in Spanish, and breaking down base 10 blocks for our children. So when we think about the power that can have an impact that's going to be having for that child and their success, in that, in that case, mathematically, um, it, it does make the work that we do here very powerful and I just truly appreciate that and I thank you for lifting up the both of the summits, the Latino Ed Summit as well as the Color of Education Summit because that is a part of our strategic plan is making sure that we recruit and retain and part of that recruitment and retainment is reaching out to teachers and asking them the things about what's working and what's not working, what can we do to really support you in the work for children because at the end of the day, we already know the most impactful person in front of those kids are those teachers. So we want to make sure that they feel fully supported. And again, I do want to raise up, um, I know that right now, I don't know if anyone knows, but right now we have, at, I know two of the schools that I've visited, um, Elkin Middle and Blue Ridge Elementary, are going to be recognized today as Blue Ribbon Schools in Washington, D.C. today. So when we think about those, the great things that people are doing to close gaps, because that's specifically what they're there for, um, I want to definitely make sure we lift up those wonderful schools who are doing that work and how we can make sure that those collaborations and those ideas and the tools and systems that are working for those districts are pushed out across the state. I know myself, Maureen, and our regional team of teachers are working hard to make sure those collaborations take place, which t then takes us to the AIM conference that's gonna be happening, where that collaboration can truly happen authentically, and we can network, and network for the betterment, again, of children. So it's all about them at the end of the day, and I really appreciate this presentation. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you, Ms. Anyone else? Madam Vice Chair? As you can see, uh, this committee is, is uh, committed, energetic, uh, involved in this task that was given to the uh, given to us by the uh, board chair. Uh, I do say to the vice chair, uh, we uh, we're not trying to uh, take the time that Bizoff takes to present. <laughs> <laughs> we're not challenging. <laughs> That's my goal. Yeah, 
But uh, when we get talking about good things, it's hard to just cut it off. That's going on out in the distance. Uh, hopefully next month we're going to talk about a program. I hope we'll get some information more on it uh, about fathers. Fathers as, uh, where's Mr. Wallace? Is Mr. Wallace in here? Yes, sir. Where's that program? Uh, was it the middle school fathers? Fathers on patrol. Fathers on patrol. Uh, that you might, we, we want to share with this community. Outstanding. But if you see some of those fathers, you will see what patrol really means. But uh, when a community comes together to support a, a school, change occurs. Things happen. And we have those things happening here in North Carolina, and we just love to highlight them uh, for the board, for the state, and others, because in isolation, it's not noticeable. But when you put it out in the public, hey, it's happening. Things are happening. Do you have any other comments, Mr. Uh, Reber? Hearing none, I do know that we've taken 15 minutes of, of your uh, committee report. Uh, we'll give it back to you next month. Okay. I'll probably need it. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Thank you. I now recognize Ms. Amy White for two committee reports. She's better than one. School turnaround and education innovation in charter schools. Thank you, Vice Chair Duncan. Okay, folks, so you know I like uh, using object lessons. So when you think about a fire, it's a crisis, right? And what happens when there's a fire? We send out fire trucks with sirens and with loud blazing horns, and we announce that we are fighting the crisis, right? Mm -hmm. So that fire is COVID. And we came in with horns blaring and, and, and sirens, and as loud as we could, we've thrown everything we can to, to battle the crisis. What happens after a fire to the house that's been on fire? I mean, it's waterlogged. Everything in the house is in, is in disarray, right? Are you with me? Okay. So, so we've had this crisis, which has been COVID. But I want to highlight Dr. Catherine Edmonds and Dr. Cynthia Martin and Ms. Julianne Garber for being the reconstruction team and the work that they have done to go in quietly because when a fire happens and after the sirens are gone, you don't really take notice to what's what's going on inside that house as it's being rebuilt. So uh, the idea of restart and reconstruction and work that's done behind the scenes by teams who silently but stealthily provide everything that's needed to get a school back up on its feet. It's the work that's been done over the past year by this incredible team of leaders. And so today, as a part of this report, by the way, I chair this committee and Mr. James Ford um, shares that responsibility for me. This work did not stop just because we were in the middle of a crisis. This work continued as they worked with schools to identify the gaps that those schools needed to continue to provide educational support on their journey towards student success. Today, um, we've been charged with providing a report to you on um, the state summary of academic gain in the restart schools across our state. As you know, because of waivers, because of COVID-19, we are not able to provide you with the academic data that we're required to give as a result of DSTR-040. But we do have a report for you today, and at the podium, I'm going to turn um, over the the um, presentation to Ms. Julian Garber to walk us through the amazing work that has continued during this pandemic. Thank you, Ms. White. Good morning, uh, Chairman Davis, Vice Chair Duncan, Superintendent uh, Truitt, board members. My name is Julie Garber, and I'm um, delighted to serve in the role of reform model support lead um, for district and regional support. Um, like Ms. White shared with you, I'm here to share the Restart Annual Report Summary from December 2020, um, that Restart Annual Report. Um, it's always important to begin. We always align with your state board, state board goals, and as you can see here, we align specifically with goal number two. 
Specifically in objective seven, you see the growth measure by subgroup and restart schools align with this. They, we use this as a part of their tracking. Um, and specifically in component one, you see that restart schools are expected to meet or exceed annual expected growth. I do want to give you a little brief reminder and overview of the policy updates that you have put in place since um, uh, to provide a foundation for you of this summary right at the beginning of March 2020, before we heard the word COVID-19. Um, you all provided some updates to the restart policy, specifically defining academic gain and then the components of academic gain, clarifying um, what continued authorization meant in a five-year cycle and also continued authorization workflow. And then um, due to COVID-19 in May of that same year, we had to come back and add a COVID-19 statement at the, at the top of the policy that extended that five-year cycle to a six-year cycle. And then clarified for um, you all and for those reporting that the annual report would not include a review of the performance data, but would still include reporting on restart flexibilities that were utilized during the 1920-20 school year. Um, and then finally, as a reminder, um, last December 2020, we added, you added, an express commitment to the model for the duration of the entire monitoring cycle. So that gives you a little bit of a reminder of where we've been. We currently now have 152 restart schools across the state. Um, in this table, you see them, they're tracked by cohort because they begin um, and in that cycle of monitoring by their first year of implementation. And so you see that table there. For the sake of our reporting, um, for the December 2020 report, there were only 120 schools, so providing you that foundation that, that during this specific report that I'm talking about, we are only talking about 120 out of the 152. And you can see them there by cohort broken down. Um, so a reminder from that last report that we shared, during the last report when we were able to report, we identified for you that we had schools that were above the expectations for what we were looking for, meeting these expectations and below expectations. Specifically, just to give you a quick um, just reminder of the components of academic gain, this is how we're tracking and monitoring the progress of these schools. We have co five components of academic gain, recurring low performing, then growth status, achievement score, subgroup growth status, and then flexibility outcomes. And the reason, of course, that's a different color is because those outcomes and goals and um, results are defined by the school. And so they have the opportunity to communicate how they're using the flexibilities and identify the measure and the progress that they're communicating how they're using those flexibilities. So again, as a summary reminder, when we came to you last with the report, um, we had 21 schools that were um, above expectations, 65 schools who were meeting these expectations, and then 21 schools who were not meeting expectations, and we call that not on track to meet academic gain in that what was originally a five-year cycle. So that's the background set for you. So we've set the stage, um, as well as Ms. White reminding us at the beginning. So now, um, because um, during that 1920 school year, we had a waiver from the federal government and from our General Assembly that there would be no performance assessments that year. And so because of that, um, in this, those same academic gain results for that, these 120 schools, um, that kind of reporting was not calculated because it was simply not available. And so what you see on the screen is those three middle columns they were simply not available for us to calculate. Uh, the schools, however, did continue to communicate their flexibilities and what flexibilities they used. And um, we certainly continue to monitor these schools. And I will say that based on that monitoring, we continued with the data that we had available. And so we continued with those 21 schools, making sure that we were focusing on them. But we built a system of support 
and we build a strong system of support, I'd like for you to think about this slide from the bottom up. And so that first foundation that we had the opportunity to build is for all Three Star schools. And so those components that you see first are for all of our Three Star schools, and then moving up to the top, we specifically identified support for schools, these same 21 that are not on track. They received more personalized support. So personalized review of their feedback from the reports, personalized review from their school improvement planning, personalized and ongoing um, professional learning. So we've had this opportunity to build a strong system of support. As a review of the flexibility specifically, we did share that they were able to tell us what specifically they used. And so we want to provide that overview for you. What specifically flexibilities did we see used in these 120 schools for sorting? You can see uh, the most widely used flexibilities in this left-hand category. We see budget, employment requirement, and cal uh, calendar flexibilities. So those are the flexibilities that are most used across, at that time, across those 107 schools. This year, we've had the opportunity to break down this information for you even further. And so we are able to now tell you, um, whereas we were able to just give broad information before, we have some, some specifics for you, that um, breaking down budget flexibility for you and these 107 schools, we have specific ways that the flexibility provided for them in terms of strategies that they were using. Now, it is important to note that these schools can use multiple strategies. And so it could be that they are, it's not that they've used one signal, sing, single strategy, but they might have chosen to use many um, strategies that fall under budget flexibility. So specifically we see that 79% report additional staff and flexible staffing. 67% are providing professional development for their teachers, 63 instructional resources, 20% are providing stipends or incentives, and then 16% new instructional programs. When we look at employment requirement flexibility, and this again is that ability to um, hire, so um, uh, I'll break it down more specifically here and keep, tra keep on track with my notes. Um, so of the 58 of the 120 schools reporting employment flexibility, 45% are hiring or placing certified staff outside of their certification. 62% are hiring non-certified staff. And again, they may be doing both of those, but those are our percentages of how they're being used across all those schools. When we look at calendar flexibility, 31, 31 of the 120 schools are using calendar flexibility but using it in multiple different ways. So 42% report an early start or end of the school year. 39% add um, more teacher work days. 26% add more time to the school day. 16% align their school calendar to the local community college. And 13% um, have some kind of a modified year-round calendar. I will note that that doesn't mean it's our capital M modified. It might have just been their own modification because we know we have year-round and um, modified specific. Um, and then when we look at a, a standard course of study and how what the flexibilities are providing for, we see that these 15 schools that are reporting a um, change in the standard course of study, it's really more about um, the curriculum. And so 73% are using curriculum that's different from their district. And then 13% are actually providing an additional course above what we would outline as the standard course of study. Assessment flexibility. 13, excuse me, 18 schools of 120 report using assessment flexibility. 44% are reporting eliminating the KEA, or what's now known as the NCELI. 17 adjust their district assessments and 11% report just a limited time, limiting the time on assessments. So that information is broken down for you, but because we've um, now been tracking this over the course of years, we can now um, provide a comparison in this table. So between 1718 all the way through 1920, you can see how the um, use of flexibility has changed over the years, but it's also important to note that the schools have also increased. So 
just recognizing that in 2017, that was just cohort one. In 1819, it was cohort one and two. And then 1920, um, one, two, and three cohorts. So the number of schools reporting, of course, is increasing. Uh, we did do some gathering of information because I believed that you would be in, um, uh, interested in this. That budget, that, excuse me, flexibility certainly did help these schools adjust on a dime um, for within their remote learning and the, the critical needs that they had to address. So with flexibility, they were able to quickly address some of these things. We drew out some information for you that they were using budget flexibility to fund things like um, digital instructional tools, equipment, professional learning, even consumables and instructional resources that were distributed to students who were away from the school but received equipment and received resources that they needed. Um, we also saw that they hired additional staff, so tutors, which I find interesting um, in light of our keynote, right? Um, professional learning provided, and so they're adjusting their calendar and adding budget flexibility to provide that professional learning to support remote, remote learning. Um, so, very interesting. Um, I hope you uh, appreciate that. It was very interesting for us to see where, where they were using um, to support the situation that we were all in. I do want to share with you now um, some the ways that we have specifically been able to support these schools. And um, just your own directive to us to make sure that these schools understand, and I should say schools and districts, excuse me, <laughs> the schools and the districts truly understand how they can use these flexibilities. So that has been around our support. So um, we were able to develop this support because we were able to hire. So in 2020, I had, um, before 2020, we were a team of one. Then we I added one person, team of two. And now last January, February, we added three people. And so uh, we have a four, what we call comprehensive support specialists, who are an amazing team of people who have um, incredibly added value um, to this work and developing a system of support. So from your own directive, one of the first things I'd like to highlight on this is that we have outlined now a school orientation and a district orientation when new sco schools come along, as well as when principal and district leaders turn over. So we make sure there's a continued support, that there's an understanding. Um, I have a real um, passion about making sure that our state support, our district support, our school support is all aligned. And so that's, you can see that at the bottom in, in uh, maroon, and that's part of my, my goal there. Another piece I'd like to highlight for you is our professional learning network. So this team of, of um, comprehensive support specialists have, has developed a strong professional learning network. We meet monthly, virtually. We highlight these schools and what they're doing. We give them opportunities to be panelists and serve as presenters and share with others. And we are hearing from the field that they really appreciate this and want to hear and learn from one another. Another highlight that in our support, and I would say it's not technically our support because we have uh, the Machado's team and the OCS team to thank for the opportunity to bring four of our restart leaders as guest fellows in the NC Access program. They will have year-long professional learning this year. Um, Another way we've been able to support and um, is going on and identifying that we, I, we provided feedback on the ANN report. Um, these 120 schools each received individual written feedback specifically about everything they wrote in their report, as well as if you're a low performing restart, you received feedback on their school improvement plan. And so in this work that we've done, um, we recognize really the need for strong school improvement teams, right? Because not only that, if, not only from our gleaning from what we read on, the, on their reports and their and plans, but knowing that if you're going to add some an innovative practice, how will you know if it's working if you don't monitor it, right? And we want, we're asking these schools, add your innovative practice, watch it, Find measures, track it, and look for your progress, and they are doing it. Um, but we understood from that process that they needed support in their school improvement planning, their school improvement team, and so what you can see in that list of professional development 
Uh, we've developed those professional learning sessions um, specifically out of the restart work, but it is now influencing the entire state. And so our NC STAR and School Improvement training that just happened statewide have used some of these sessions all across the state. So it's been a benefit not only to our restart schools, but all across the state. Um, with that, I want to just move on and say we have one recommendation for you. And just um, in light of our impact on COVID-19 and the lack of performance data, we need to adjust our statement again at the top of the policy. And so it would simply read, for approved free start schools implementing as of 1920 and a 2021 school year if it impacted by COVID-19 and the lack of data, the monitoring cycle would be extended to a seven year cycle based on the availability of data. And with that, I want to just in closing, before I ask if you all have any questions, um, two things. I want to share with you that um, we will have, you will have the opportunity to hear from one of our restart districts and schools in January. So we'll have them come and share with you, and I think that'll be a wonderful opportunity to hear again from the field. And then also I just want to take a moment and thank Dr. Emery. I know that she's not here today, but um, when I stepped into this role, she was stepping into the role, into her role first here, and um, she came from a district in which she was very, very involved with the beginning of a restart school, and that was Cook Literacy. And so her wisdom and guidance certainly helped me um, as we developed what these schools needed. So I just want to thank her for that. So with that, I'll ask if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Great presentation. I'll, I'll turn to my colleagues. As you can see, they're doing amazing work. Um, behind the scenes and really digging deep to peel back the layers and the strength of cohorts and collaboration and um, I'll make the jump to what the charter school community does with a, a, a needs assessment and a, a sort of an investigation that's what you've provided with an outside lens to look deeply um, sometimes when you're in the midst of something you can't see things yourself because you're living it breathing it every day but having that outside um, critical friend um, approach can um, provide some laser um, laser style interventions that are effective. Um, anyone have a question or a comment? I have a question. Dr. Oxendine. When you um, go, thank you for your hard work, it shows, and you're always enthusiastic when you come to the mic. Um, I can tell you love your work. So tell me a little bit about this um, point. Um, do you look at the district strategic plan 